boys and girls. We're in for a treat today because our guest speaker is Professor Françoise barret sinossi who is the Director of Regulations of Retroviral Infections Unit at the Pasteur Institute of Paris. Professor Sinossi was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine in the year 2008 together with Professor Luc Montagne for their discovery of HIV virus. Their work made it possible to clone HIV-1 genome. This led to the development of methods of diagnosis of the virus and the development of new antiretroviral drugs. There is no doubt in our minds that HIV has been the greatest enemy of the century and her work has led to substantially decreased in the spread of the disease and increased expectancy and quality in life. Professor Sinelsi received her PhD in Virology from the Pasteur Institute and University of Sciences in Paris. And now she heads her own research group with the Virology of Department. She has, been, she has established much collaboration with poor countries severely affected by HIV, such as Cambodia and Vietnam. Professor Sinelsi has published more than 220 articles in scientific journals, has presented more than 250 papers in international conferences, and has 17 patents. And she is presently working on a mother-to-child transmission of HIV, along with her team of 20 scientists. We are very honored to have you here. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Boswell Barré Sinos. for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. I'm indeed very, very happy to, to be there today at the International School of Phnom Penh. And I would like uh, uh, to thank the school for welcoming me uh, today. I would like also to thank uh, the International Peace uh, Foundation uh, for inviting me uh, to come here. It's really my pleasure, thanks to Juve. Uh, for organizing uh, these uh, uh, bridges uh, dialogue events uh, here in, in, in Cambodia. Of course, uh, I, I'm particularly glad because Cambodia is uh, a country which is in my heart, uh, which is in my heart since I'm uh, working uh, uh, in, in very close collaboration with Cambodia since now uh, 15 years already. Uh, and I feel like home here in, in, in Cambodia, indeed. So, you know, when Uwe asked me uh, and invited me to participate to this uh, bridges uh, uh, dialogue events, uh, uh, I, I accepted, uh, I think, uh, very rapidly. I accepted very rapidly because I, I felt, first of all, that it's a really wonderful idea, and I, I'm very sensitive uh, of uh, uh, the fact that uh, bridges uh, between uh, uh, culture and peace are very important. It's very important to improve the dialogue between scientists and, and, and other parts of uh, the society. Uh, including politicians, including the public, the civil society, and so on. And if I accept that because as uh, researchers working on, on HIV AIDS, I've been able to see myself how much the dialogue between us as scientists are uh, working on, on a terrible disease deadly disease at the beginning have been important for the translation of uh, scientific evidences into action. 
since the very beginning of uh, uh, the research on, on, on HIV, on HIV AIDS, we uh, establish a, a very nice dialogue, I must say, between us, the scientists, the clinician, health worker, uh, involved uh, uh, in, in the fight against uh, this deadly uh, disease, and the community of patients. And we really work very strongly together to fight against inequity. And certainly HIV AIDS is uh, among the best example showing and highlighting the magnitude of inequities between low resource countries and rich countries. Certainly, rich countries has been the first to benefit of the progress of research. And there is still a gap regarding the access of uh, the progress of research in the developing world. So before leaving you the floor for a question, which is, I think, the most important part of uh, this meeting today, uh, let me just very shortly give you some feedback on the history showing how much uh, uh, the dialogue and the, the, the scientific-based evidences are important for decision, decision at the level of uh, political leaders. We uh, isolate and identify the virus causing AIDS in 1983 and uh, very rapidly our idea was uh, to translate the discoveries in application. The first application was, of course, uh, to develop diagnosis tests. Diagnosis tests to avoid the transmission of the virus and infection of uh, hemophiliacs and also by the infection by blood transmission. Indeed, this was very quickly done since uh, the virus was isolated in 1983 and in 1985 already a diagnosis was commercially available. That was the first key progress, scientifically evidence-based. The second progress of uh, research in the field was certainly the development of treatment. The first uh, drug that showed an efficiency for controlling the multiplication of the virus in the body was a drug called azidotimidine, AZT. And the first data were available as soon as 1985. So only two years after the discovery of the virus. So this drug was used in HIV infected individuals. And we found out that unfortunately, uh, the patients that were on that drug were escaping to the treatment, developing viruses that were resistant to the drug. However, very rapidly it has been shown that this drug, even alone, can reduce the transmission of the virus from the mother to the child. This was already a very, very important issue the prevention of mother-to-child transmission by antiretroviral drugs. Since this treatment was not the best for 
the treatment of infected individuals, scientists, clinicians work together with the patients to provide new data on combination of treatment. And in 1996, we already had data, again, scientific evidence-based data, showing that the combination of three molecules, three drugs, was very efficient to improve the patients. And today, we know that this combination of treatment is reducing the mortality of uh, the patient by more than 85%. This treatment is widely available in rich countries. And today, in our countries, in Europe, United States, we are not speaking anymore about AIDS. We say that uh, we have patients living with HIV on treatment. Some patients were treated very early on, and they are still alive for more than 15 years now. And they are doing perfectly well. Of course, it's not a cure. We do not eliminate the virus by this treatment. And of course, we have to consider the fact that a small proportion of patients on treatment, long-term treatment, are developing some complication. Complication like cardiac injuries, like uh, metabolic disorders, including aging process, which uh, develop more rapidly, Alzheimer's disease in, 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 in a small proportion of patients in heart. Of course, now we are learning more and more how to manage better uh, those complications by uh, intervention and modifying the treatment as soon as there is the first sign of complication in those patients. But we have, let's say, in rich countries, a profile of what we call the non-AIDS associated morti mortality or morbidity in HIV patients on treatment. Yes, and we have to work on that today and to have some more uh, scientific evidence-based approach for the future. In the low resource country, we unfortunately have still the profile of AIDS related morbidity and mortality. So we still have inequity between rich countries and poor countries. This is certainly not acceptable. Of course, a lot of effort has been done. Of course, uh, the scientific community uh, together with uh, uh, the, the clinician, health workers, and, and the patients and representatives of patients have raised their voice, raised their voice very highly, highly to make pressure, to make pressure on political leaders from the rich country to make the drugs available to all in the world universal access to treatment. The universal access of treatment for all should have been successful for 2010. We know that we will not reach the goal already. Even if in some countries, like in Cambodia, they already reached the goal. Cambodia is one of the best examples where the political leaders here in Cambodia have been very reactive. 
very reactive and took decisions. Of course, with the help of international organizations, for making available the access to antiretroviral treatment to HIV uh, positive uh, patients that need to be treated here in Cambodia. Of course, uh, the problem even in Cambodia is not over because still too many patients are arriving uh, in health structure or in hospital too late. And uh, we know, again, scientific evidence show that uh, if the patients are treated late, the benefit for the patient is not as good as if they were enrolled in the treatment earlier. So still, even if a political decision are important and political decision and willingness are a critical issue and the dialogue between scientists, uh, uh, representative of patients and clinicians are very important is not sufficient still. That means that the dialogue with the public, with the population is important and shall be important. We still have a lot of obstacles today to improve access of treatment. Of course, we have financial uh, issues and uh, it's not enough uh, funding for the universal access of treatment yet, despite uh, uh, the international effort that has been made all over the year. We estimate that uh, we have about 40% of patients in a resource-limited country who have access to treatment today, 40% is not enough. That means that like 60% of them do not have access. And they do not have access either because of lack of political willingness, like it is the case not here in Cambodia, but in other countries, like for example, Russia, uh, there is no political willingness at all in Russia for the access to treatment. And for countries where there are political willingness, the problem is to have access to the patients. And why is it so difficult to have access to people that are infected by HIV? Of course, it's depending <laughs> of uh, the organization of the health system in, in those countries that need to be improved. Of course, it's also due to the fact that uh, those countries very often lack of uh, human resources sufficiently <coughs> trained and educated. Of course, also, it's because the information and the education of the population is not yet sufficient. So that means that it's still our responsibility for all of us, including you, the younger generation, to be part of uh, this uh, education, information to the population. Imagine for people like me, uh, we have been facing a terrible period where it was very difficult to say to the population, please go to the test. Go to the test because if you are infected, you should take measures for not infecting your partners or for a woman if she was pregnant, to say, please go to the test because if you are positive, you should not be pregnant. Until we had the treatment. Now we can say to those people, please go to the test. Please go to the test because 
you will benefit as fast as possible at individual level of this treatment. And in addition, you will less transmit the virus to others. So it's a double benefit, individual benefit and collective benefit for others. Will you and will be part of the reduction of the epidemic everywhere in the world. Because since you are on treatment, you have a reduced amount of the virus in your body, including at the level of genital secretion, and you reduce the risk of transmitting the virus to others of about 90%. So today, we are in a situation that we can explain to the public that uh, there is benefit of testing for them, for their family, and for the society. Of course, that's not sufficient. That's not sufficient because very often the public is afraid. It's a threat to go to the test. Why? Why? Because of the non-respect of human rights issues. Since the beginning of uh, this epidemic, it has been a lot of discrimination, stigmatization of the first population that unfortunately were affected by HIV infection. In the early 80s, we were not even calling <coughs> this uh, disease AIDS. This disease has been first called the 4H disease, homosexual, Heroinomen, hemophiliacs, Haitian, <coughs> because the first countries where the disease was recognized outside of Europe and the United States was Haiti. This was a terrible mistake. This was a terrible <laughs> mistake because we forgot at that time in the early 80s one age, which is the most important age, heterosexual population. The infection is uh, mostly transmitted heterosexually. 80% of the cases worldwide of infection are in person that has been infected by heterosexual relationship. It has been a mistake because everyone keep in mind still today that it is a disease affecting some population that are behavior uh, that are not really respected. This really make me angry. Because, first of all, we have to respect the behavior of others. We have to be tolerant with others. It's also part of uh, the equity to respect the other, to respect the human rights. And of course, you know that uh, those components are certainly the basic value of peace. So I mean, if I'm telling you that, it's because today one component which is in opposite of prevention, of reducing the incidence of HIV infection worldwide, is still injustice and non-respect of human rights. In some countries, People that are HIV positive are put in jail. Where 
of course, they are not treated. But not only they are tr not treated, but uh, they went. They are going to violence. Shall we accept that? Not only now. We have to raise our voice against this kind of uh, decision in countries, in some countries. For us, so the community, and I'm saying communities, because we are really all together since the beginning, the scientists, the clinicians, the workers, and representatives of patients. We are ready to raise our voice, but we need we need other voice. We need the voice of the civil society as well. And you are part of the civil society. And you are educated. And we need you. We really need you to convince others to stop. To stop the injustice and to stop the inequity and to stop the non-respect of human rights. It's important for HIV, but not only for HIV. It's important for the respect of uh, one very important thing, life. And life is really the, the only thing which is important. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, if you would like to, uh, if you want to continue the dialogue and have, uh, ask questions of Professor Bade CDC, so uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and stand up when you're ready to, uh, when you're given the microphone. Hi, um, so where do you think the AIDS first initially originated from? We, uh, we know that AIDS uh, originates from Africa. Uh, we know that uh, <coughs> you know that we have two types of HIV. HIV one, which is uh, uh, the type of virus that is causing the major cause of the epidemic, and we have a second type of HIV called HIV two. We know that. HIV-1 originate from the introduction into human of a virus from chimpanzee. And uh, according to genetic analysis of both the chimpanzee virus and human viruses, uh, we can estimate that the introduction uh, was uh, at the end of the 19th century into human in Africa. Regarding HIV-2, the introduction uh, into human is from a monkey as well, but from a monkey species in, uh, in West Africa called Megabis. And when you compare the monkey virus and the HIV-2 virus from human, we cannot even make the differences between the monkey virus and, and the human virus. And uh, the, the genetic analysis also uh, uh, clearly indicates that the introduction uh, of the virus from Mangabees to human is at the beginning of the 20th century. So, uh, but what I, the threat, I would like to stress the point, that uh, those introduction has been very rare, very rare introduction. For HIV-1, uh, we have been able to uh, estimate that it has been only four introduction of uh, virus from chimpanzee into human. So rare cases of introduction, but that can be sufficient. Then you have the epidemic that we have today, and as you know, the cause of the, the epidemic is not really the monkey, you know, it's humans that are the cause of the epidemic. It's just uh, at the origin that we had uh, a zoonosis, which is for, uh, let's say, for most 
infection uh, by viral agents, it's uh, a transmission from one species to another species. You heard also for the swine flu. Uh, it's also from animal to human. So for HIV, it's exactly the same. The origin is from animal to human. But again, yeah, it's a very rare event. Many people who have HIV are economically disempowered and are left with little employment opportunities, especially in developing nations. Um, how, how do you think this issue can be addressed at a localized level? Education is, uh, of course, a, a, a very important issue. Education of those uh, population to empower uh, those uh, uh, populations through education program. Uh, and you know that there are several uh, programs conducted by uh, uh, different uh, uh, international organizations on empowering uh, those populations uh, through education program. Uh, I think uh, this is certainly a very important uh, issue. And of course, I mean, uh, it's through the education program that uh, uh, information education program, counseling, speaking with each other. It's the reason why I'm here. I mean, the dialogue between those populations and others are very important to change uh, the, the profile in the future and to make possible for those populations to benefit of uh, the progress in, in science as well. <coughs> um, has science been able to transmit of HIV AIDS from mother to child when breastfeeding? <coughs> I did not, uh, because you were not speaking uh, entirely into the microphone, so I got some problem to hear the entire part of the question. Okay, um, has science been able to prevent the transmit of HIV AIDS from mother to child when breastfeeding? Yeah, this is a very good question, and uh, there is progress, yes, certainly on, on that area. You know that mother to child transmission occur mostly at delivery or by breastfeeding. And uh, the antiretroviral treatment that I mentioned before, it's able to block the infection at delivery, the transmission at delivery, but it was uh, the remaining transmission by breastfeeding, and this is uh, really uh, an important issue, especially uh, for uh, developing countries. Because in Europe and United States, the, 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 the mother don't breastfeed anymore, and so there is no risk of transmission. In those countries, breastfeeding is important uh, for the nutrition of the infant as well. So it was a, a real debate uh, regarding breastfeeding. Because on one hand, we knew that uh, it was a risk of transmission of the virus from the mother to the child by breastfeeding. On the other hand, if we were recommending to the mother not to breastfeed, we knew that uh, we will have all the risk of mortality of infants due to uh, nutrition, due also to the appearance of other disease, uh, including other infectious disease in the infants. So researchers have been working on, on that issue, and now I, I can say, uh, to summarize all the data that has been accumulated over the last years, that it's clear that uh, when the, the mother and the baby are treated after birth by antiretroviral treatment, and during breastfeeding for the mothers, then you don't have any more transmission of uh, the virus by breastfeeding. Uh, again, it's based on antiretroviral treatment of the mother, which is very efficient to prevent 
the transition like that. Um, I, I saw an article where a patient infected with HIV AIDS was cured through bone marrow um, transplant. Do you think this process really works? Yeah, it's uh, the story of a patient uh, that were uh, with uh, what we call uh, a mutation. He has a mutation in uh, one uh, receptor for the virus called CCR5 uh, and it, it was uh, HIV positive, received a bone marrow transplant and currently uh, is doing well after now uh, several years uh, after the bone marrow transplant and uh, according to uh, the authors he has uh, almost eliminated it says the virus because of the mutation uh, in, in, in CCR5. Personally, I think it's an interesting observation, scientific one. But uh, to be very honest and frank with you, I don't think this is applicable at a large scale. To have bone marrow transplant uh, with uh, uh, such uh, uh, approach of uh, uh, infusing bone marrow transplant, we see a receptor, a co-receptor deletion in CCR5. How can you apply this kind of approach in developing countries at large scale? So it's again. Scientifically, it's very interesting, and probably we, we can work on other strategies derived from this scientific observation. If, let's say, if it is confirmed in another patient, because my knowledge up to now is only one case, what can you say about one case? Of course, one case is not significantly significant. Uh, so we need to confirm this case. And if confirmed, then we have to think about uh, uh, strategy, strategies, scientific strategies that derive from this observation. But not, I don't think it's feasible to apply this kind of approach at large scale. Um, could you possibly outline some of the key strategies being explored by scientists today in order to find a cure to HIV? Of course. Uh, first, let me tell you that uh, why we don't have a cure for HIV. We don't have a cure for HIV and we cannot totally eliminate, eradicate the virus from the body because the virus is not only in the blood, uh, it's uh, in different compartments of the body, and because the virus is not only dividing, multiplying in target cells of uh, the different compartments of the body, but the virus is also capable to stay in a latent form within the genome of our cells in different compartments of the body. And the, the, when he, the virus is already in the genome, in the genetic material of the cells, the drug cannot reach the virus. Secondly, the immune system, since the virus is dormant, the immune system cannot see the virus. So the virus is there, on, especially uh, in patient on treatment, you control the virus that divide, multiply, but you cannot control the virus which is dormant. Which means that uh, if you stop the drug, then the cells where the virus is dormant become activated and the virus which is dormant start again to replicate. 
So the first idea was to say, okay, since when you activate, you can induce the virus which is dormant, let's try the following strategy. We are going to have patient on heart, and then we will stop heart and treat by immune immunomodulators, molecules that can activate the multiplication of the virus in target cell. It's what we call uh, immunomodulation. That has been tried with interleukin-2, interleukin-7, then there is an interruption of treatment, and to see whether we can maintain uh, an undetectable viral load after immunomodulation, because we eliminate the multiplication of the virus by interleukin viral treatment, even after activation of the cells, and we reduce the size of the reservoir. Up to now, this approach has not been successful. Another approach that has been used is to use vaccination. Vaccination with a similar uh, uh, rationale. Thinking that uh, if you vaccinate with uh, an immunogen, both HIV immunogen, you will activate the immune cells and you will activate the virus which is dormant. And if you combine both vaccination with antiretroviral treatment, you should be able to, to reduce the size of the reservoir because you activate the latent virus and you treat immediately by antiretroviral treatment. Up to now, this approach has not been very successful as well. That is not to say that we have to stop this kind of approach. It's probably we uh, have to uh, still work on it by modifying the protocol that has been used up to now, uh, by modifying immunogens that has been used for uh, vaccine therapy, uh, by modifying uh, uh, the schedule of immunomodulator and so on. Another approach with, which is still really ongoing today is uh, to intensify the antiretroviral therapy. Thinking that intensification protocol with heart might be helpful for reducing again the size of the reservoir in the body. I must say that the first data, again, were not so successful. And the, one of the drugs that has been used for intensification of the treatment was uh, raltegravir. It's uh, an inhibitor of uh, the integration of the virus into the cell, thinking that uh, if uh, we can uh, uh, block the integration of the virus into the cells, then we will have less uh, dormant virus into the cells. The data are not so much encouraging the case the data obtained up until now. There is some of the studies uh, going on uh, right now, we don't have the data yet, uh, which are based on Intensify, intensification of the treatment, but early after uh, infection, in order uh, to reduce as fast as possible the establishment of the reservoir in uh, the body. And I, the last point uh, I would like to mention is the fact that uh, on basic science, we Several researchers are working on trying to understand better the mechanism of establishment and persistence of uh, the virus into the genetic material of the cells. They are, they are getting more and more data today. And uh, there are 
new drug on development today, which aim to unlock the latent virus from infected cells. We don't have the data yet because it's really uh, uh, still at the level of basic science, uh, but uh, I'm quite uh, optimistic that uh, within the coming years, we will have new approach, new strategy to reduce the size of the reservoir. I'm saying reduce the size of the reservoir. I'm not saying eliminate, eradicate totally the virus because I'm working with this family of retroviruses since uh, almost 40 years now, and I can tell you that uh, it's very difficult to totally eliminate latent retroviruses from infected cells. So my guess is that we shall be able to have what uh, Tony Fauci and others are calling functional cure of AIDS. That means to be able to reduce the size of the reservoir in the body. That we should be able to reach that point. Who's next? Uh, hi. The, um, the drug industry is a, a multi billion dollar industry. And um, they can produce drugs to make us sleep, to make us wake up, uh, all sorts of things. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the economics of AIDS and how uh, quickly or slowly the uh, major, uh, the multinational. Uh, pharmaceutical companies got involved in producing antiretroviral viral drugs uh, at a low price and distributing them or helping them get distributed into some of these countries uh, where it was uh, uh, really needed. I mean, that has already been done somehow. Uh, you know that uh, uh, originally when antiretroviral drugs were developed by a private company, Originally, the price uh, for antiretroviral treatment, a complete antiretroviral treatment for per person for year, was more than two thousand U.S. dollar per person a year. Uh, and of course, this was not affordable at all for uh, the resource limited countries. It has been so much pressure of the international communities on the company, on also the government of uh, different countries. That as you know, it has been uh, accepted that generic could be produced in case of emergency in some country, in developing country, like India, like Thailand, like uh, Brazil or South Africa, have been produced generic drug, low cost antiretroviral treatment, which are today quite widely available in uh, resource limited countries. And most of the treatment that are treated in developing countries are treated with generic drug already. And as a result also of uh, the production of generic and usage of, of generic for large scale access to treatment, the private company have reduced the price of uh, their own drug. And I can tell you today that even some antiretroviral drugs produced by private company are even at lower price than the generic itself. So it's just to tell you that, I mean, that has been done already and we shall continue. We shall continue this pressure on, 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 on private company, still for the, what we call the second line treatment, some drugs that are used uh, to treat patients when they escape, when there is a failure 
of the first treatment, uh, we need to change the combination of drug. We call it the second line treatment. And not all the drugs for second line treatment are uh, uh, produced at low cost. And that should be done later on for what we call the third line treatment. If the patient is kept to the second line treatment, a failure to second line treatment, then they shall have access to the third line and up now, none of the country, almost no country uh, in the developing world have access to third line treatment. So we should make pressure. So it is possible for uh, the students and for everybody to have an influence on how AIDS is, uh, is looked at in the community, in the world. It look like So it is, it is possible for the students, for, um, for our community, to have some sort of an influence on these companies to try to, uh, to make change. Exactly. I mean, it's a, it's a reason why the voice, raising the voice of everyone, uh, the community in general, is so important. And, and we have seen the results. I mean, HIV AIDS is a good example how much we can influence by making pressure all together on the private sector. Uh, how do you know if you have HIV AIDS? <laughs> how do you know? You go to the test for the test. Okay, because uh, you can carry HIV for years without any symptoms. Okay, and when you start to have symptoms, it's too late. So, voluntary testing is how to know whether you are HIV positive or not. Okay. And the test is first of all serological test to look whether you have antibodies against HIV. And if, unfortunately, you are positive, then you will have access. Um, to what extent do you think it is the government's responsibility to support people who are HIV positive in terms of financial It's critical. <laughs> It's critical because we can see when, go, when there is no government commitment, willingness. And it is in those countries that you don't have access to care and treatment for the patients. So, I mean, it's certainly critical. It's not enough, but it's a, a, a critical issue if there is no decision at the level of the government, then nothing will stop. It's been the case in, in, in Cambodia, as I mentioned before. The government is here, the Ministry of Health and the national program of AIDS, uh, depending on the Ministry of Health, has been very reactive in uh, First of all, starting by education, information program, distribution of condoms, and so on. And we have seen the results. This is a political decision at the beginning to have a strong prevention program through information, education, condom distribution, and so on. And as a result, I was, I told you before, in 95, at that time, the, 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 the prevalence of infection in prostitutes was around 15%. And because of this initial decision of the government, it has been, as you know, very much reduced. So, I mean, originally it's really the political decision. After, of course, that's not enough. When there is political decision, then all the others should participate. Health worker, representative of patients, 
the population itself, the media are important. Of course, it's important to to have information via the media, through the media, to the population. I just, you know, uh, spoke with uh, uh, one collaborator of uh, the community group here, uh, the community group responsible for the national aid program in Cambodia, and he just told me, and I think this is a very interesting decision also, because to make sure that patients that are on heart remember that they have to be followed regularly and don't forget their appointment with the doctor. They are launching SMS program to send an SMS to the patients. Don't forget your appointment with your doctor tomorrow. I think it's an interesting, of course, initiative. And this is part of the decision of the Ministry of Health. Of course, the application of those decisions are depending on us. Okay. And I mean, it could be in collaboration with the private sector, with uh, telephone companies, and so on. So I mean, again, so it's, a, it's a question of uh, communication, dialogue between the all uh, uh, part of uh, the society, including the political leaders. Um, as you said that education is one of the key aspects of preventing the spread of HIV AIDS and sexual education plays a central role in this but in many nations the topic of sex itself is very culturally and culturally sensitive so how do you overcome that cultural bias? By dialogue again, I mean we shall speak about, I mean it's of course, it's uh, in the tradition of, and the culture of some countries uh, they are not used to uh, speak uh, very uh, openly, let's say, to a uh, sex problem. I think it is, it's depending on, of us, of all of us again, to change uh, the, the tradition and the culture by just starting to speak more and more about it and uh, to get all together. And to, I mean, you know, if I can give you an example, uh, I'm coming from a Catholic country. Uh, and of course, at the beginning of uh, HIV AIDS in France, in 1980s, you know, our government decided to launch uh, an agency for uh, fighting against HIV infection. It was an agency for prevention through education information program. This agency never worked at all. It was a nice decision of our government. However, it didn't work. Why? Why? Because the information education program, the launch, was so scary about speaking frankly regarding the sex issue that it did not work. I remember that uh, they were sending me the, the, the document that they were planning to distribute and I said, look, uh, uh, you should be, uh, speak very openly uh, to, uh, uh, to the public, otherwise it will not work uh, if we don't uh, say frankly uh, what are the risks when we have such a uh, uh, type of uh, uh, sexual relationship with other, what are the risk issues and so on, uh, according to uh, uh, the sexual relationship, relations that you have with your partner. 
uh, the population will not understand anything and uh, we will not change any behavior. I say, oh, but we cannot. We cannot because, uh, uh, you know, uh, the parents, if they go through the documents, and we say that uh, the French government uh, should not explain that to young adolescents. The conclusion, as I said, though this program did not work at all, the campaign that made, none of them worked until until uh, a non-governmental organization started to make the job and start to speak very frankly and honestly, start to show in the public, in high school, how to use a condom with model, with condom. In high school, of course some parents were raising their voice, this is terrible to show to our child how to put a condom in public. But it turned out that those campaigns of uh, education and information work very well. And it turned out that after a few, few years, one or two years, the government said, we stop our national agency of fighting against AIDS we are going to support these non-governmental organizations because they are making the job and it's working. So I mean, sometimes it's difficult for governmental organizations to, uh, to say very openly and to speak very openly about sex, but uh, non-governmental -organ non organizations can do a wonderful job and the situation that uh, we had to face in France in the early 80s, I think is the same situation that you have in still today in other countries in the world. I mean, Spain had the same situation that we have in France because Spain was even more Catholic than France. Italy had the same problem. But it has been organized through many uh, non-governmental uh, uh, organizations. I think it's a way to go, to organize ourselves and not always think that the government will organize it. You mentioned uh, that uh, uh, the original goal of 2010 uh, uh, universal access to to antiretroviral drugs to, to HIV treatment uh, was originally uh, set for 2010, and that that's not going to be attainable. What is a what it, what what uh, revised goal should we be uh, thinking in terms of, and and what's it going to take to get there? So the the revised goal today to reach uh, the millennium goal for development number six. That means to have access to antiretroviral treatment for all in 2014. Whether we will be able to reach it or not, it's really depending what will happen, let's say, by the end of this year. Because by the end of this year, it will be uh, the uh, meeting for replacement, replacement of the fund, of the global fund by the United Nations. And it's really uh, depending on the decision of uh, the government leaders. We are quite worried, I must say, now. We are quite worried right now because the G8 leaders did not entirely respect their commitment for 2010. And uh, because of the economic crisis, of course, we are not convinced at all that they will 
respects and commands. What the, the, the executive director of the Global Fund is uh, doing right now, I can tell you, is visiting all the countries, all the donor countries in the world, including not only the G8 countries, but as well uh, the G20 countries, to expand uh, the donor country in order to replenish the fund of the Global Fund. We will see the result, as I said, at the end of the year. Uh, however, we are all concerned because of the economic crisis. We have to make pressure. Uh, we have to raise our, vo our voice. Certainly what uh, we are trying to do right now, we will do even more at the International AIDS Conference in Vienna in July. This is one goal of the International AIDS Conference in Vienna. Uh, we will be all together uh, to raise our, vo our voice uh, uh, to the government leaders at that time in July. We have also to think about new strategy of funding for sustainability. And uh, of course it will take time between uh, uh, creating and uh, implementing new strategies for funding. But there, there are already some ideas going on. Uh, the first one, as you know, was probably uh, the one launched originally by our French government regarding a tax on airplane tickets uh, that uh, was for usage. Uh, regarding uh, uh, treatment 